good morning, everyone. Um, this is Jane Garibay, state representative for the 60th district, and we are on the porch. Today's guest is Dr. Pauline Chen. Um, Pauline is a best-selling best-selling author for the New York Times. Um, she is a good friend. She's a grown and born Windsorite. Um, and she is a physician with the Boston VA Health. Good morning, Pauline. Good morning, Jane. How are you? A crazy question yeah. in these times, I know. <laughs> it's a loaded question in this time, but I'm doing okay. And I hope that you and your viewers are doing okay. It's yeah, um, you know, out of every um, difficult situation comes positive. And we have to deal with the bad things happening, but there's so much goodness and so many things um, happening across the country that are good. Um, but it's people like you on the front line, um, you know, in there working with our veterans um, and COVID and all the other, we forget there's all other kinds of health issues and situations and things going on. And then you add the COVID on top of that. It just, um, you know, does is there anything else because you have so much on your bio that you would like people to know about you and don't be shy you're very impressive well i i think the item that i'm most proud of is that i grew up uh, in windsor connecticut and i grew up in a town that has that embraced me and my family mm -hmm. um Time we were probably the only Asian American family in the community. Wow. Um, I went to Pequannock Elementary School, started kindergarten there through sixth grade, mm -hmm. went to St. Mark Junior High School, and then went to the Loomis Chafee School, where I'm still very involved. I am uh, a trustee there, and actually, I also sit on their COVID 19 task force. Right. And my daughters, I recently moved back for a few years while my daughters were attending Loomis Chafee, which was very nice. I was commuting between Windsor and Boston, but it was really nice to go back as an adult because I fell in love with my hometown again and with the people and met people like you, Jane. Mm -hmm. I, I think there is, there is a great sense of community and of the greater good in yes. Windsor. And I think that's really important, especially now, especially as we're facing this pandemic, because there are very few illnesses that we see as physicians where it is so obvious that in order to combat this disease, in order to fight it, we really need to think not just about ourselves, but about other people. We cannot, we can no longer say it's someone else's problem. You know, right. it's a problem. And I think in Windsor, I think we have the DNA, you know, the mm -hmm. to do that. we really do. And I agree with that. So one of the topics that I haven't heard a lot about, you hear a little bit, but it hasn't been on the forefront, is how, I'll call it the cord stress how yes. this stress is um you know affecting me affecting us and i know of a person that said if i couldn't have gone back to work because they had been sick they said my wife and i we would have gotten a divorce and they were half joking right but i mean you dear do hear about that um sometime living so can you tell me something about you know our mental health and what should we be doing to maybe um you know be okay. It, it is, it's absolutely an issue now. And I think it's going to be, you know, we talk about the surge um, and we talk about the issues involved with the COVID itself. But I think there is another aspect that we will be seeing in the, in the not too distant future, which are the repercussions of the quarantine being mental health issues, number one. Um, number two, the huge number of people who are no longer seeking regular care because A, they're afraid to go to hospitals or emergency room, um, because they're afraid of going into their doctor's office. And so I think it's great that you brought this up because this is something that we need to start 
thinking about and planning for just as um, with just as much details and concern as we are doing for the social distancing for the infection. Mm -hmm. I am concerned because I think that until we get a vaccine or right. a treatment, we're going to be looking at social distancing being part of our life. And I think, Jane, you were the one that said this to me. It's not, I think we shouldn't say social distancing because I think being social is so important to us as human beings. Physical distancing. I think I mean, that's why restaurants have been hard because Americans, that's where you meet your friends, your family, everything is around food and being exactly. together and celebrating. Exactly, exactly. Getting a cup of coffee together, which is what you and I do. Right, right. Yeah. I think, right. And even just hugs, you know, or handshakes. Um, my parents, um, who still live in Windsor, have been really involved with the First Church yeah. um, for decades. And, you know, the fact that you can't have physical services, I know that they are, um, Pastor Nicole is having services through television. I know a lot of the churches um, and synagogues are doing that, but there's still something, even if it's just saying hello in the grocery store, there's something about seeing other people and interacting with them and feeling that kind of connection that I think is really important to ourselves. I think though, I don't know if this helps, but I have to say that people who are social distancing, are physically distancing, are really, I know they talk a lot about frontline heroes um, being in the healthcare world, but I think they should consider themselves, everybody should consider themselves a hero because to physically distance is difficult, number one, but the results of physically distancing are incredible, the impact. I mean, we have seen in Massachusetts, for instance, we have enough personal protective equipment um, in our hospital system. Um, we have enough beds in, in my hospital system and in many of the hospital systems to handle the increase in cases. And that is thanks to social, physical distancing. Because if people hadn't done that, oh my gosh, I think we would have a situation very close to New York City, which is just heartbreaking. It is heartbreaking. Um, and I feel that because as you may know, Windsor has one of the highest levels. Uh, it is the number one in death in our nursing homes per capita. Yes. Um, and there are people, they may have come from a different town or whatever, but they live in Windsor now, they vote in Windsor now, so there are people, and we're trying to look into ways that we can support, because not everyone has all the PPE, not all of them had, you know, sufficient training to even know how to put on the equipment. Right. You know, every, I, I guess I truly believe in my soul that everybody is trying to do the right thing. I... I agree with you, Jay. You know, like when you say people wearing their masks, it's not fun. Half the time I can't breathe and I can't wait to get home and whip it off, you know? It's not easy, but they are heroes. People trying to do the right thing are heroes. I agree with you. And it is, it, I think you bring up a very, very good point. This happened so quickly that we, as a healthcare force, as a service force, I mean, we did not have enough time to go through the training and the um, experience of using PPE regularly and correctly. I think right. that's actually a real issue. There is a whole art um, to putting it on correctly, but more importantly, taking the things off. Because if you take them off incorrectly, or if you walk around a little too far from the area where someone who's infected is sitting, you increase the risk of other people getting infections. And so, but that takes, you know, as someone, so my training is in surgery, as someone who has been trained in sterile procedure and in, in donning and doffing gear, it's even difficult for me to do that regular, to do that regularly and without thinking about it constantly. Right. So, yeah, or you know, just remembering to wash our hands, those little things. I mean, we all wash our hands at certain times, but it's almost like you got to remind yourself every half hour, wash your, you know, 
wash your hands or use antiseptic. And um, if you have the cloth mask, you got to wash them, you know, exactly. um, just remembering. I mean, I, every time I wash my hands, I sing happy birthday twice. And I know, I mean, they keep telling you to do that, but I think it's really, really I'm important. I'm going to try that. <laughs> it's, it's really it's the right amount of time. So, I, you know, I just, I want to add though, that despite the fact that this has happened so quickly and we've been unprepared and, and just, it, it just happened so quickly. You mentioned earlier on that the pandemic has also revealed some wonderful things that mm -hmm. people sort of the good points. You know, they say that COVID-19 infects indiscriminately, but it also shows you some of, I mean, some of the weaknesses that exist in our society, but also some of the, some of the real beauty, beautiful points. So I have a very good friend um, whose um, mother, so this is one of the issues with COVID that we're trying to deal with in the healthcare system. Um, visitors aren't allowed into the hospital anymore. Right. Contagion. And I have a very good friend, um, a, a magnificent person whose mother um, became ill with COVID-19, elderly, and was admitted to um, St. Francis, actually, local hospital. And at a certain point, it looked like she was not doing well. Um, I helped my friend spoke to the doctor taking care of her. And I was really touched because this doctor taking care of my friend's mother was a young doctor. I mean, she was basically an intern. She was an intern. Mm -hmm. And she had such a, a, a wonderful understanding or wonderful appreciation, I guess, right. for the fact that people are dying alone and we don't want to do that. So I was very impressed by her. And as it turned out, my friend's mother um, did eventually die of the disease. But one of the things that the hospital did, that the nurses and doctors did, was they managed to find a set of gear, protective gear for my friend. And she was able to spend a few mm -hmm. hours at the very end of her mother's life with her mother, sitting with her. I mean, covered in all this stuff, of course, but she was able to hold her mother's hand. And awesome. Yeah. And I think, I, I think that kind of, um, that moment, the ability for our, um, in the midst of this darkness to find light is just, yeah. Yeah, and I think so we need to acts of kindness out there. We just got have to remember them. Exactly, you know? we need to remember them. We need to hold on to them, and we need to remember that every single one of us is capable of that. Mm -hmm. Every one of us is capable of, of contributing to the greater good by physically distancing, mm -hmm. by supporting you know people who can't get to the grocery store, the elderly, the people who are vulnerable. Um, by supporting, um, you know, even as far as supporting legislation that helps ensure that everybody can have some access to care in this time. Right. I think one of the most important things is that we learn from this and we make yeah. things differently. And I ask people for patience, for example, the Department of Labor trying to get out the unemployment checks. Well, there's been more than the past, what, four years altogether. So they are working hard. They're trying to hire extra people. They're trying to get this out. You will get your checks. It just may not be this week. There's some glitches. The software's old. So that shows us we have to update that. So people are going through all this stress um, and we're trying to help them. You know, your landlord can't kick you out. Most mortgage companies will defer three months and add it on at the end. So all these good things that, that people, even companies are doing um, to help citizens. But what can I do at home when I'm starting to have stress? And, you know, for me, it would be I'm hearing people's stories and I'm trying to help them. Or the person where both people have been, um, you know, they're on, they're unemployed now and they have to, what can we physically do? I know like eating good foods i keep hearing people say i've gained 10 pounds you know because everyone's home binging on people say <laughs> the 19 the junk food um so i think eating 
normal or good is very important. You know, trying to get sleep, exercise, out walking. What Absolutely. else can we do? Pardon? Wearing a mask, out walking, yeah. wearing a mask. Yeah, wearing a mask. Absolutely. Because people think outside it doesn't, but it does. Yeah. And it stays in the air. You move on, but if you have it, the virus stays in the air, right? And someone else can walk into it. Right. And what you do by wearing a mask, again, this is an act of, of, of courage, I think. Actually, courage and love. You protect others. Yes, yes. You protect others by wearing a mask because, you know, a significant portion of patients, we don't know the exact percentage because the disease is still big to yeah. us, but are asymptomatic when they are infectious. And so even if you feel fine, I think wearing a mask is very, very important. Um, I think you really sort of hit it on the nose, Jane. I think you need to, um, to make sure you eat right, um, drink plenty of fluids, um, exercise. Um, if you can, get some fresh air, a little bit of fresh air every day, even if it's just sticking your head outside and, you know, stepping outside of your doorway and right. taking breaths. I think, you know, one of the advantages that we have now that people didn't have before is we do have ways of connecting with one another mm -hmm. by you know facetime or right. zoom and connecting with friends you and i have facetime jane yep. i think that's really really important um and i think you know calling people calling older people yes. um in on them writing letters um doing those things that there are other ways that we can connect and I think, I think you, you know, there has been work done, um, it's in younger people, but showing that if you do good in some way, you feel better. And I think that that may yes. help all of us get through this, but you also have to be kind to yourself. I think that's really important. Um, you know, if you aren't, uh, so if you aren't doing the things you normally do or not getting everything done, it's okay. Right. You know, I totally agree with that. We're in extraordinary times. Yeah. So yesterday we did, um, I got a call from one friend saying, and I'm going to use a fictitious name, you know, Heidi, normally her curtains are open in the morning and they're not open and I've tried calling. So we went in the morning, then we went back in the afternoon and we, she still wasn't answering. So we called the police because they do wellness checks for, you know, situations like this. Um, but she finally came to the door before the police got there and we knew she was okay. Um, but that's the kind of, you know, check up on your family, your friends, um, be aware of what's going on. You know, we had a happy ending and the police were, you know, they were wonderful. They weren't mad at us for calling. Um, so yeah, that is really important. It is. And what I tell patients, what my colleagues tell patients, is if you're worried, just call. Just right. call. Um, we're not saying just come in just in case because we right. are going to, but just call. And it doesn't have to always be about infections that could be potentially linked to COVID. It could be about, you know, if you have heart disease, if you have diabetes or high blood pressure, or if you don't have anything and you're worried, just call. Oh. That's what we're here for. And most doctors are doing the tele you know, yeah. through the computer like we are, they're either Skyping or Zooming um, and connecting with patients and a lot can be done. I don't think it takes the place right. of being your doctor, but in these times, it's the best to keep people safe. And if they really need to see you, they can't figure it out, then you go into the office. Right. And I, and I would say that the vast majority of offices and hospitals, emergency rooms are, so we... I think the telehealth and the telephone is a great way to figure out sort of a first line, you know, who to go in. And then once you go in, I think that the hospitals and emergency rooms and clinics and offices, they're doing a really good job of trying to decrease transmission of infection. And so I think if you have to go in, um, do go in. It's not, um, I think the health, care settings are really trying to protect patients so that it's not like you're walking into a miasma of virus and infection. Right, no, 
well, as you know, I went into St. Francis on a Friday afternoon and it's scary. You know, my sister said afterwards, she goes, as I'm driving away, I'm thinking, I didn't even hug her. What if they keep her there, you know? Um, so it was, but everything was super clean. You go into isolation rooms. Um, the staff was so professional and so good. And at first they thought they were going to keep me. Um, but after they did the chest x-ray and they gave me IV because I was dehydrated, they actually helped me. So I didn't, if I had waited a few days, you know, it might have been a different situation and they were able to get me like up and rolling um, and I was able to crawl and go out. But it is clean. It's not, you know, it is. It's very clean. It's very professional. They take care of you. They care. So if you have to. Right. And, you know, I have a lot of faith at the moment. I mean, I have a lot of faith in the people who are running Connecticut, um, people like you and Governor Lamont. I really... You know, when you look at the decisions that have been made, um, I think that they make sense to me as a physician. And I think they've helped to flatten the curve, you know, a term that we use a lot, which is basically stretching out the rate of infection so that hospitals that don't have enough beds, free beds, can take care of everyone, plus the people who normally need to be there. But right. I think they've done a great job. And mm -hmm. I think the citizens have done a great job because it's it's really hard to do and the businesses it's it's really really hard on everyone yeah. um yeah and i think connecticut i think we're fortunate because we have a high rate of hospitals per capita mm, yes do you know yeah. what i mean so in other states where they don't have um the hospital system that we have and that they actually joined and are working all together to fight this virus that's another good thing where they're um, yeah. together. So yeah. it could have been a lot worse. It's bad. It is bad, but it could have been worse. Exactly. We're very lucky in New England. Um, you know, there are counties in the United States. The famous fact is there about oh, more than half of the counties in the United States don't have critical care capabilities. That means if you get admitted to the hospital, um, and if your condition deteriorates to the point where you need a ventilator, you have no options if there's no critical care uh, uh, beds capabilities in, in your county. So we're very fortunate in that. Um, so now I'm going to pray for sunshine this weekend so I can sit out in the backyard with the dog. Um, but it is just trying to do a lot of self-care. If you love to read, read. You want to play with the dog, play with the dog. Um, stay off the news channel 24-7. That's yeah. another thing I found because I was all day long. I had the TV on and I was listening. So now I want to be informed and I want to know. And I always listen to the governor's um, updates and watch a little bit of news. But I find some people saying, but I watch it all day. That's all I do. And it's hard to break away. But you really need to, need to, to do some of that self-care. Right. Self-care is really important. And just with the economy as it is and the job, issues going on as well as the the human repercussions yeah, of the people are suffering it is hard yeah. um, just, not to make light but my husband is so thrilled because i've been home i've cooked more in the last six weeks than in the last six months you know <laughs> and i hear that from other people you know and um so it's really you know we're looking for the positive in things and being able to do and i think that being a realist but understanding that there are people suffering and you know how can we help i challenge every person who has not le lost their jobs yes help a neighbor a 50 dollar gift card to the grocery store maybe it's some flowers from your garden that's a right? tip for the person who's delivering your groceries um, yeah. you know and even something that doesn't take any extra financial strain is saying right. thank you to the postman post person, uh, you know, just saying thank you to the frontline, you know, essential workers. Um, right. And let's not forget, it's not yeah. just your workers. I have to emphasize that. Saying right. thank you to teachers who have yes. you know, suddenly had to deal with online teaching. Um, to, I mean, there's just, there's that so would have been a deal breaker with me with the technology. <laughs> <laughs> so I admire they had to learn things real quick and do, but I think of the custodians in hospitals and in nursing homes, Absolutely. they're on the front line and we don't always think of them. Oh so, my God. And it's very, know. 
scary. It's very scary. I mean, in our hospital, I watch them go into these rooms and, you know, they're protected, but, oh, I, it's just, it's, one is always on edge. <laughs> right. I can't imagine. And Windsor has, um, Windsor and Windsor Locks has a high population of healthcare workers. Yes. That's like the second most, you know, the profession that people have. Um, so we know they're out there from, you know, no matter what they're doing, the custodians, whether you're, um, you know, the aide going in to help the nurse, the doctors, it is everyone, our fire, our police, you know, our town workers that are keeping the streets still going and, you know, doing what they have to do. Exactly. It's, uh, again, I think back to what you started this interview with, which is it's shown us these incredible acts of kindness that people are doing. And I, I think, you know, when, when, when people signed up for their jobs, I don't think they necessarily signed up to do them at risk, at potential risk of life and limb. And the fact that they're still doing them is just, you know, it's, it's incredible. I mean, I, I realize that, you know, financially it's important, but still, you know, right. to do this and to put your life on the line and not only your own life, but you know, your families. Um, because even if you're one of the fortunate um, people who don't have severe symptoms, you know, your mother at home may be one of those people. Right. Or your, your child. There are some children, even though the mortality rate is, you know, significantly lower among children, um, children do get sick. I mean, we all get sick. There are people that do get sick at every age range. So, right. Just, and you just don't know who it's going to hit and when, because it is, it doesn't, you know, it just goes. Cause I've seen some perfectly healthy people in their thirties right. you know, pass away. We um, don't know enough about the disease yet. I think that's part of what is so frustrating. It's going to yeah. take, take time. This is the disease I have to say, you know, in the hospital, it continues. I, I would say that almost every week, I learned something about the way the disease manifests that surprises me because it's not sort of, it's, it's not like any other viral illness. It's like out of a sci-fi movie. That's what we <laughs> compare it to. You know? <laughs> yes. So but we'll, well, I want our time is up and I want to thank you so much for coming on. It's just good chatting with you. Oh, it's um, great. Every chat. time we talk, I learn so much. So I really appreciate your giving up your time and coming oh, on. The every time with you i'm inspired thank you so much for all your <laughs> for my hometown okay and thank you thank you